This is a production of Cornell University. Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, you can tell I'm probably not a member of SIPS. My name is Paul Solo. I'm part of uh, Biomedical Sciences, and it's really my privilege to introduce today's SIPS speaker, Joe Ecker. Um, uh, Joe did his undergraduate at Rutgers. He did his PhD at Penn State and a postdoc at Stanford. Um, he was a Penn faculty member before moving out to the SOC where he was an HM HHMI investigator. Uh, so I went through his CV, there are really too many honors and awards to list. I'll mention just a couple of them. Member of the National Academy of Sciences, fellow of AAAS, uh, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's won some notable awards, including the Beadle Award from the Genetic Society of America and the Gibbs Medal from the American Society of uh, Plant Biology. Uh, we have at least one award winner as well in the audience, is uh, June Nostrala. Uh, Steve Tankson was an award member. And I'll also make a plug for an upcoming uh, seminar by Craig Picard, who's also a recipient of that award. So that'll be on um, August, April 16th. So hopefully we'll see you again for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, there's so many things that really characterize Joe's career. Um, and I'll just try to distill down a couple of them there. He's really had some pioneering work in genomic structure. And this really extends even back to his graduate days when he was characterizing viral isomers of varicella zoster and detecting them in human tissue. This, these were notable um, changes or things that had not been recognized in viral genomes. Uh, he got very interested in also further genomic manipulations as a postdoc in Ron Davis's lab uh, at Stanford, developing some tools for inhibiting uh, RNA uh, processing, or rather RNA expression patterns in plants using antisense. Um, he developed uh, methods for cloning large pieces of DNA and yeast artificial chromosomes from Arabidopsis that were really seminal events and really being able to sequence the Arabidopsis genome. And of course, he developed many different uh, available, widely available mutants in the Arabidopsis genome that a number of you are, are, have used and will continue to use. Again, really big impacts on, on, on these fields. Um, uh, now, um, he also was very interested in underlying mechanisms of, of gene regulation and plant development and, and in work that he began in Ron Davis's lab that is continuing now really focuses on, on mechanisms of signal transduction and how ethylene is, is regulating um, uh, fundamental processes in plants and of course other hormones as well. And that might be something that a lot of you will follow. Now, uh, working at, uh, at, the, at the SALK, he's in the midst of a bunch of neuroscientists. And accordingly, he's gotten very interested in some of the opportunities that neuroscience has that can apply methods that he's developed. Uh, and one of the things that I should also add is that um, although I'm not a plant biologist, I became very aware of some of the work that Joe has done in plants when he really reported the very first um, uh, methylome uh, from Arabidopsis, initially using uh, microarray approaches. And then later on, the very first single nucleotide methylome from Arabidopsis was produced uh, by work that he did with Steve Jacobson. And because sequencing technologies are so robust, he was able to expand that to the mammalian genome, and that's, and that's what he uh, has done more. Uh, the single cell methods that he's using really provides enormous resolution for what we know about tissue structure and tissue regulation. Um, I'm going to keep quiet now, and I'll just ask Joe to wow us with the signs. Thank you, Paul, for that very kind introduction. Um, I guess and when Adam invited me, I, I didn't quite realize that this was a, a talk in the School of Plant Sciences, but I will actually talk about a little bit in the beginning about how I got into this, you know, neuro stuff, but um, I'll, I'll sort of start in the kind of with more fundamental things that we're interested in, um, which is really, these are the systems that we use. Um, so he actually doesn't look too different, Arabidopsis and <laughs> neurons. So, um, there's some similarity here. It's easy to get by in the lab. Are you studying this or this? So what I want to talk about today, actually, I will briefly talk about some studies just to kind of um, tell you what we've been doing the last few years in Rapidopsis in terms of epigenetics. That's what links these together, interest, our interest in reprogramming and uh, epigenomic diversity in, in cells and, and populations of, of, of cells and populations of plants um, and how these epigenetic marks change during development. And then I'll, and I'll sort of switch to our sort of neuroepigenomics approach. So the sort of theme is, and I'm sure that you're all equally interested, many of you in the same theme, which is how you go from one genome to many cell types. And 
<clears throat> how much of that is hardwired. I mean, to get cell types that are all reproducible, there has to be a heritability component to this. But there's also things that go awry in development through genetic mutation and, li and likely due to epigenetic variation as well. And just organized a keystone meeting um, called the 3D Genome with Bing Ren and, and Anna Pombo. And Brad Bernstein was talking about some epi alleles that happen in cancer. They're really truly epi alleles that there's no genetic variance detectable. Um, and so how you go from here to here, um, <clears throat> every cell, I used to say I, I, an I, identical genome, but that's not true. <laughs> There's a lot of somatic variation that happens. Um, mutation, structural variation, transposition, et cetera. Um, most of that I believe is probably destructive in terms of the function, not instructive um, in the genome, but nevertheless it happens. Um, work from Chris Walsh and Rusty Gage and others um, is quite interesting, looking at lineages by following mutations through development. But there's obviously additional information needed to read out to create this diversity. And so then you have the Arapidopsis version here with equally beautiful cell types that we're also interested in from the five chromosomes. So we, um, so defining, usually there's some onus on the speaker if you're talking about epigenetics, especially with Eric Richards in the audience, to define what you mean by an epigenetic state. And, I, and so I, I, I don't have my own definition. I, I adopt this definition, which I like very much by Adrian Bird. Structural adaptation of chromosomal regions as to register signal or perpetuate an altered activity state. There's some component of the heritability of things like DNA methylation um, that, that, that kind of ring true for me in this statement. So, you know, accessibility to the genome is, is, the, is the issue here and sort of transcription factors being able to access chromatin modifying, chromatin, modified chromatin proteins being able to bind and inhibit uh, uh, proteins, transcription factors from binding, DNA methylation attracting and inhibiting proteins from binding to the genome. And so, Genome access is a sort of feature here. Um, we're particularly, and so these are some of the roles here that sort of been, I would say from the very beginning, you know, one of the earliest features of trying to understand the epigenome is the regulation of transposons, silencing. It's been <clears throat> somewhat challenging to, uh, for some of these other topics to really kind of get to mechanism. One of the things that we're interested in is, and in kind of driving a lot of these studies is, to understand the role of a, a single modification, let's say this modification, cytosine to adding a methyl group in the five position, as to whether or not that impacts directly on transcription factors interacting with the genome or not in the motif. There are a number of labs I'll mention that have been working on this, and I'll, I can, I'll briefly mention some of our studies in this area. Um, so sort of step one for us was try to understand where these modifications are occurring and what time in the development of the organism reprogramming or they're occurring to be able to then begin to ask the question of whether there's any impact. So these surveys are based on sequencing, uh, as Paul mentioned. And so a few years ago, a plant biologist in the lab, Ryan Lister, who has his own group in Perth, developed this assay, which we call methyl C-seq. And in parallel, Steve Jacobson, we had been working together on array-based approaches and then kind of diverged and started developing our own methods separately. And Steve also had a paper very almost as, like the same month or so, um, which was very nice, um, and using a different method. So essentially, this is the old chem, this is an old chemistry from the 70s that then Sue Clark and her colleagues adapted for sequencing, which is to treat um, uh, cytosine with high temperature and sodium bisulfite, which you get a deamination reaction. You end up cytosine to uracil, which when you copy that results in a C to T change in the DNA sequence. And so that simply, we just coupled that assay to shearing and making a genomic library, adapting it with methylated adapters so that they wouldn't change their sequence. And then using the, actually the very first Selexa machine, one of the machine number 11, I think we had to be able to do this. Um, so that required some challenges of developing tools for being able to, to, to map reads, 
I won't go through the details of this, this was published a long time ago, quantify cytosine uh, at these various positions. And so CG, so the context of methylation for some of the enzymes that methylate DNA is to methylate C sitting next to G on the same strand. And so that's a symmetrical event where you have methylation on the, after replication on the opposite strand of CG. But there's also an asymmetrical methylation, which actually is well known in, in Arabinopsis, was really unknown in the mammalian genome, was CA, which has no counterpart of cytosine on the opposite strand, so asymmetric. So it can be, this context can change. It can be CAC, CAG, depending on the developmental stage. Um, and that information then can be used to, to build, um, so we call these single methylation events, single methylation polymorphisms, or SMIPs, sort of equivalent to SNPs, where you have methylation variation at one position. Um, the variation comes from the fact that, well, you either have two, 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 two alleles, you have, you know, 50% methylation, zero or 100. But when you have a complex tissue that where you have cells having different methylation profiles, it turns out that you, you can have a range right, anywhere from you know, no methylation to 100% throughout that whole range. So there's so-called partially methylated domains, lowly methylated domains. And typically what investigators do <coughs> is, to, um, is to cluster these together into larger regions, which we call differentially methylated regions or DMRs. And these just happen to be, what we're looking at here is a, a segment of DNA where each gold tick here is a methylated cytosine in a CG context. And these happen to be, you know, this is a small portion of the, of a, of a embryonic stem cell genome. Uh, and and, and what, what we're looking at here are either real embryonic cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. And you can easily spot this difference in every single, every pluripotent stem cell we've ever looked at has features in the genome that have resulted from the inability to be reprogrammed by uh, four transcription factors that Namanaka won the Nobel Prize for. 99.9% .9 of the genome is amazingly reprogrammed with those factors. But there are certain regions of the genome that are re resistant to reprogramming. They can be, they actually have a, a histone modification that's preventing the that the factors are prevented from uh, reprogramming the, the associated methylation. That information can be associated with other kinds of histone modification, open chromatin, et cetera, transcription factor binding assays to create maps of, a, of the epigenome, if you will. And so um, we've worked on a rapidopsis um, sort of profiling of various states. And this just shows some summaries of some of the things that we've been interested in and we continue to be interested in, but as you'll see it, it's sort of different level of resolution. So we've, we've worked on with Philip, Philip Benfi's lab on profiling cell profiles of the root, for example, epidermis, cortex, endodermis, uh, et cetera, where Phil has you know, done fact sorting of, of, of protoplasts and then we've profiled um, the methylomes, for example, the transcriptomes uh, of uh, also the you know, small RNA profiles of the diff different cell types. And we could identify lineage sort of cell lineage specific um, DNA methylation of events. Um, we can also identify regions that were responsive to either biotic stress or pathogen response. Again, this is treating a whole leaf, for example, with the pathogen and then doing whole, you know, Essentially, if you have a million cells, you're profiling a million methylomes in the same tube, right? So it's amazing that you can see any differences here at all. And you'll see from some of the neuron studies I'll show you that our eyes were open when we started to switch to, to higher resolution methods. Or uh, collaborations that we've had that look at um, nutrient changes, uh, collaboration with the Ryan Lister's lab um, in, 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 in roots, uh, for example, phosphate stress, where you have even have heritable uh, change. They're not heritable for very long, they're heritable, let's say, for a generation or two, but those methylation event, methylation differences can be can be inherited for a short period of time. Um, we've also looked at sort of generational inheritance of, of methylation. This is work from Bob Schmitz, who I hear is coming for a seminar in a few weeks. And Bob will tell you all about this. I just wanted to point out that you can use a rapidopsis, use these mutation accumulation lines that Ruth Shaw had developed over 30 generations and Bob profiled 
you know, individual cytosine methylation over these, we call these sort of ancestors and then descendants of those. Looking at individual methylation variation over time, you can see that some individuals lose this CG methylation at this one particular position in replicates here. So they've lost it somewhere along the line. And I think Bob has looked at more carefully now where, where, the, where this is lost, what the frequency is. And Telef Weigel's lab actually has done some work, very similar work like this. And so, you know, the ancestors are, are more similar to one another in the methylomes and the descendants are similar to one another, but they're different from one another. And in fact, the difference is very large. There, there's five orders of magnitude. If you compare sort of genetic accumulation mu mutation with these kinds of events, which we're not sure what the meaning is, but certainly they're heritable events, they, there's about five orders of magnitude difference. But if you, if you look at more striking events like this, where you have a gene that's not only methylated in the CG context, but has this non-CG or asymmetric methylation, which is indicative of what Arapanopsis recognizes as transposons by an RNA-directed DNA methylation uh, system. These kinds of events typically are associated with silencing. So if you look at, at the mRNA levels of th these correspond to your ind individual one, individual 19, individual, and then these are the descendants. Some of the descendants here, descend number 59 in replicates has lost this methylation. And you can see this is log two scale here. So there's a hundred fold or so increase of transcription of this gene. So perfectly good gene, okay, as far as we know, that has been silenced in this genetic background, Columbia Zero, the wild type, that $70 million sequence genome, um, is now released from silencing, okay? So, and then the, 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 the genes that were silenced uh, uh, were associated with small RNAs, and those small RNAs disappear in this. So you have a flip of this so-called epiallel event that you can measure. You can measure the frequency. The frequency of this happening is about the mutation frequency in the genome. Okay, very similar, that the Weigel's lab sequenced actually all of these lines and determined the mutation frequency. And this frequency of sort of gene activation from silencing is about the same as mutation frequency. Um, <clears throat> so that looked interesting. So we expanded this to then look at thousands of Arapidopsis Ar genomes. And so we, we have a, a, a kind of a resequencing project that involved many labs, particularly the labs of Magnus Norberg and Detlef Weigel, involved with, and, and Monsanto company, Todd, Todd Michael and Monsanto sequenced 500 accessions of Arapidopsis. And we did, my lab, transcriptomes for those and um, DNA methylome sequencing. And, and this was kind of the intersect of those. And this just shows some of that, you know, a snapshot of just some of those. So we're able to sort of monitor these events. Magnus Lab has become particularly interested in associating this kind of epigenetic variation, whether there's, you know, more, hype, more, more methylation or less methylation and associating that with sort of temperature and precipitation gradients. Um, and one thing we found that was quite interesting was is that some of the absolute methylation levels of these accessions were actually genetically driven, at least by these genome-wide association studies. So these are the five rapid chromosomes. If you use methylation as a phenotype and you ask, are there loci that are segregating, that is the in this genome-wide association study that are linked to the propensity to have more or less methylation, you identify genes that are well-known in methylation pathway or the RNA-directed DNA methylation pathway or the enzymes themselves that are like maintenance methyltransferase and MET1 that have variants that these haven't been proven, but Magnus's lab is, is working on this. But I think the most striking finding for me out of this was that that if you, if you look at any Arapidopsis gene, you can say it can either be unmethylated, completely unmethylated. I think Bob will talk about body methylation when he comes. So this CG methylation here, which is mildly associated with gene expression differences, and this kind of methylation, which is associated mostly with silencing of the gene, that if you take across all the Arapidopsis genes across the 1,001 accessions, and you look at their methylomes, about 25%, Okay, seven, over 7,500 genes can exist like this. The Columbia gene is silenced, this, this, this accession is silenced, and the others are not. So you can have in the population 25% of all genes that could be a perfectly good gene, uh, but they're silenced. And they can potentially flip back, just like we saw in Columbia. Some of these may be associated with transposon insertions, et cetera, but 
I think there's quite a few of them that are very likely to be a gene that is somehow triggered to have been silenced that could potentially be relieved from silence and be expressed and potentially be selected for um, if it had a phenotype. So from those same lines, we we're able to um, take the, their DNA and then ask whether or not transcription factors will bind if the DNA is methylated or unmethylated in an assay we call DNA affinity purification sequencing. So we take genomic DNA, shear it up, um, and take affinity tagged transcription factors and do this sort of in high throughput. We screened um, 1,700 Rapidopsis transcription factors over 2,000 experiments and, I, and essentially um, identified you know, TF motifs for about 10% of the genome. But we were particularly interested in whether or not they were methyl sensitive binding. Uh, and so to do that, um, we, we sort of modified the assay where we just take the library that we made here, which is native genomic DNA, which is, hasn't been amplified and where you have methylation events that might affect binding and just amplify the library so that we remove, dilute out with non-methylated cytosine so that we get this AMPDAP library. And then, um, then we can compare that to sort of genomic information from real ChIP-seq experiments. So this is in vitro, but here's just an example. So here's a, a transcription factor, an ABA, uh, a, ABA is a plant hormone that is um, involved in uh, as sort of well, this is one of the master regulars for ABA signaling. And the chip seek shows a peak here, but no peak here. When you strip the DNA and you do an in vitro assay, you see binding here. And if you test in vitro a the ABI, the AB, ABI5 gene, it's methylation sensitive. And so this is in vitro assay, but comparing it to the chip seek result in a methylated region, it looks like it's sensitive. So if you take um, and you ask uh, from this set of peaks where we know these in vitro uh, transcription factor assays are binding, you ask how much real estate is that? If you look in leaves, um, just leaf tissue, right? And I ask how many transcription factor and binding sites might be occluded by this methylation. There's potentially 170,000 of this 2.5 million that could be potentially regulated in that tissue because if there's no methylation, you know, it could be chromatin regulation, but there's no ability for methylation to affect it. So there's, there's potential there. Uh, and then you can take and do this across all transcription factors. You can do the DAP assay where we're looking at the blue here is the, the lack of binding in these families. Okay, so 70 some percent of the transcription factors show an effect. Uh, uh, 4% show they like to bind. So if you see orange here, this, you know, for mostly zinc finger family members or TCP uh, or other MIBs, et cetera, they like to bind more. And if there's a depletion here, this is a window of 400 bases. There's a depletion in the binding in that, in that target. We haven't brought this right down to the motif. But if you then use amplified DNA, it, you see that it's ra rather normalized. So you remove the, the methylation um, and, and, and the transcription factor affinity is, is altered in those cases. And so that's just also displayed here. This is the gradient of all the transcription factors that either like to bind methylated DNA or how they're, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, the, uh, anything close to here would be unaffected and anything that would be affected would be really affected would be here. And when you remove the methylation, it sort of normalizes that. We didn't do it in a competitive way. We, these were done in parallel experiments, so that's a caveat. But if you do it in competitive, other labs have done it from a mouse transcript, human and mouse transcription factors in a competitive way. And they see very similar results. So what are we doing now? This is kind of the end of plant part where we're, we're trying to do this and capture both the epigenetic variation in the methylation assay as well as the genetic variation. And what you can see here is sort of a transcription factor in this in vitro binding assay where you see differences. You see two peaks in one, accession, you know, maybe some additional peaks that are weaker. And so some of these could be SNPs, some of these could be methylation variants, et cetera. Here's an example of two strains and some methyl three strains and methylation differences that you see. And we begin to associate those differences with genes that are then maybe involved in, in for example, temperature response across these plants or stress tolerance. And so we're just beginning to do that now. And we're, we're going to take this to a different level. We want to not just grind up and look at the whole sort of methylene. We can't 
fact sorts. So what we're doing is using, you know, as a model, seedlings, etiolated seedlings, which we know a lot about, and hormone responses to basically carry out single cell sorts of single nucleus is what we do. We don't use protoplasts. Protoplasts are very different in size. The cell uh, volume is very different in the plant uh, depending on what tissue it is. And so you have very big biases in what gets faxed. And so the nuclei are much more uniform. So we, used, we do single nuclear RNA-seq and single nuclear attack-seq. And so we're, we're going to try to look at both genetic and epigenetic variation on certain responses, particularly hormone responses, using these assays. So I want to sort of switch to, to what we're spending a lot of effort on. So applying some of these sorts of methods and trying to understand epigenetic variation, mostly in the mouse, and some in the marmoset, which is a very good model for behavior. We have a marmoset colony at Salk. And then the ultimate challenge is the be this beast here, um, <clears throat> which has massive numbers. If you look at cerebral cortex here, and just looking at neurons, there's seven, 77 here. There's 16 billion neurons in the cortex. Actually, cerebellum is, like the, is the winner here. It's 69 billion neurons. Most of your neurons are in, in the cerebellum. Um, so that's a massive task as part of the NIH Brain Initiative. Most groups are focused on the mouse with 80, 80 million neurons or so. So why do this? There's a lot of um, interest um, in understanding cell types. There's a project called the Human Cell Atlas. Um, and there's a, sort of the equivalent of this in the Brain Initiative that we're part of. It's called the Brain Initiative Cell Census Consortium. Um, and so one, there's a couple of reasons to do that. We're interested in potential of epigenetic variation have an effect on disease, but there's also been an enormous effort to link genetic variants to, for example, psychiatric disorders. And this just shows sort of heritability of phenotypes like anxiety, um, attention deficit, post-traumatic stress, bipolar disorder, et cetera. So there, the missing here, it should be 100% here, right? No, it's, for some of these, there's missing heritability. could be absence of um, large numbers, necessary numbers to identify um, all of the genes that are involved, all the SNPs that are involved. Or, in fact, it could be that there are other environmental uh, epigenetic effects, you know, other sort of things that happen during the development of an individual that are not necessarily directly easily linked to SNPs. And so this is the SNP-based heritability here. So I think, um, so this is just an example of some genome-wide association study from schizophrenia, which has the very largest number of, of individuals that have been examined in these. Um, uh, this is a gene that popped out that was published just a few years ago. Very interesting, kind of somewhat controversial complement uh, involved in the, uh, um, uh, in, in blood, re the response to the complement system of the blood is involved in, in uh, a major loci involved in the, the number one loci involved in uh, uh, that comes out of the GWAS screen. So, so our, our, our sort of hypothesis here is that these, um, that cell types, um, uh, the cell type uh, phenotype is going to be affected by these individual SNPs. In other words, you have a SNP that's associated with a genetic disease, and you say, oh, it's enriched in the, the, the SNP falls out outside of coding regions and falls in some regulatory region um, in the brain. That is, if you grind up the brain and look for uh, open chromatin histone marks indicative of regulatory elements, you, you find that they're enriched in brain. But Brain has a massive numbers of cell types to still account unknown. This just shows part of the cortex that we're working on. And these are the layers. There's uh, six layers. And uh, um, uh, these are inhibitory neurons. They have different, different electrophysiological properties. They have different neurotransmitter properties. And these are some of the sort of morphologically defined cell types in the brain. And so our... Um, our hypothesis is, is that we could separate these different cell types, either by their transcriptome or maybe even uh, um, by looking at epigenetic states in these different cell types by profiling individual epigenetic states. And in, in the process, either 
a, from normal brain identify regulatory elements and potentially from disease brain identify mis dysregulation at some of these sites. So that's what we've been working on. And so if you actually look at the catalog, this is sort of well known, uh, if you look at the catalog of genetic variants, and the same is true exactly of Arabidopsis, all numbers are almost the same, 95% or so of the, of the genetic variants do not lie in coding regions, okay? They lie in introns or intergenic regions, et cetera. And so, so most of the genetic variation between the UNI is going to be outside of our genes. And so to, to associate a SNP in a regulatory element with a gene is, is, is a task that many groups are interested in, trying to understand gene regulation, basically. And so this, this involves, um, for example, association of enhancers and promoters and um, a lot of interest in understanding how these come together and the mechanisms by which enhancers are involved in transcriptional regulation through, for example, looping here. A number of proteins have been identified in these, in these complexes, but um, uh, understanding epigenetic variants or understanding genetic variants and their association with these elements, I think, is one of the goals of the project. And so that can be done by beginning to accumulate information in a sort of cell type specific way. And a few years ago, we had a collaboration with Jeremy Nathan's lab to sort of reproduce the experiment that we were doing with Philip Benfi and purifying populations of, of, uh, of neurons, excitatory and several classes of inhibitory, parvalbumin expressing or VIP expressing inhibitory neurons, and then profiling those cell purified cell populations. Um, so either looking at different chromatin marks, active chromatin marks, acetylated histones, or DNA methylation, this is CG methylation, and then identifying regions that you have their association of reduced methylation or these DMRs. We have hypomethylation and, for example, active chromatin marks. So here would be an example of the association of uh, a predicted enhancer element by the fact that it has an, a particular uh, class of histone modifications, A3K27 acetyl, and, and it reduced in DNA methylation. Okay, so you can you can identify neuron type specific at this level, excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But you have to go through purifying these populations through genetic tricks where you've tagged these cells in vivo and then purify them. Um, and so I guess the idea here is, is that, you know, uh, trying to understand uh, this, this enormous pool of information we have for genetic variation by beginning to start from the bottom up by identifying cell types, their regulatory sequences, and then beginning to link those. Uh, and, and developmental profiling, because these things change, these differentially methylated regions change over development. Um, and trying to associate risk variants uh, by, by kind of building up the regulatory element code uh, and then associating it with genome-wide association studies. So, um, but along the way, so this is sort of a geneticist point of view is that, this is, you know, linking genetic variation to actually where the genetic variation may have an effect. But there could also be epigenetic variation in here. For example, chromatin uh, dysregulation and particularly that ca is caused by some reason or DNA methylation variation. So we don't have evidence for that. We're sort of building maps of the wild type brain basically in mouse to find that. But what is known? So there, there are interesting and data. That's why we kind of launched into this in the first place. Um, changes in DNA methylation or proteins that bind to it, like this MECP2 protein, which causes Rett syndrome, um, cause learning and memory defects and are associated with cognitive decline. Okay, so there are known, very few, but there are some known proteins that could read out DNA methylation in, in mammalian cells, um, but also mutations. So you can make a knockout, a triple knockout of a, of a cell line of an embryonic stem cell and it grows just fine. But if you try to make a mouse out of that, you can't. Okay, we work from Rudolf Janish and others. So mice with postnatal, also you can knock these out after birth and they have effects on excitatory neurons, learning and memory, cognitive defects. But very little is known about when or where these kinds of changes are happening in methylation. And so that's where we sort of got into this, beginning to look at the patterns of DNA methylation and chrom open chromatin changes, and then ultimately with the idea that we want to try and understand whether these effects have any causality. 
and there are intriguing kinds of papers that pop up. I'm, I'm not showing you the most controversial ones. I'm just showing, showing you some recent ones. One from one of my colleagues, Rusty Gage, where uh, he has this maternal care model. It's been actually a model that's been around a long time where, where the, the, the amount of association of the mother with the pups in terms of the grooming behavior has an impact on whether you get more or less transposition of, of line one elements in the brain. And that, that there is some association to, of those ability to transpose with a reduction of DNMT3A, which would be involved in the silencing of these line ones. So somewhat controversial, it happens but whether or not there's a cause effect relationship between this and is, is hard, to, hard to get at. Rusty's lab is working on that. And there are other studies that are somewhat more controversial that have smaller effect sizes where you, you have a sort of a, 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 a mimic a viral infection in utero. And then those mice often have, will have statistically significant behavioral defects. Uh, and that you could attribute that to some variation in, in, in demethylation. Again, very little known because we don't know much about the normal brain, okay? So it's sort of part of the project is to move from whole tissues down to single cells to try and kind of get the resolution that we're interested in. So we started out, you know, profiling the cortex of the mouse brain. Um, and this was published a while ago. So we just separated neurons from non-neurons, supporting glial cells of various types. And then we went to this sort of uh, enrichment approach that we carried out with Jeremy Nathans, where we could use a, a, a genetic trick to tag nuclei of various sorts using an insertion of a protein into the nuclear membrane that had a tag that we could then purify these different populations in a in a, in a controlled developmental way using Cree, um, and then carry out these sort of studies. And then more recently, I'll tell you about our single cell analysis that, and what the differences are here. So just back to the beginning, what did we see? Why were we interested? So we, we did a developmental profile of mouse uh, and human cortex um, very crudely, and looking at grinding up the whole cortex. And this is just measuring the bulk amount of CG methylation or the CH methylation. And so there are actually really dynamic changes in what, what part of the genome gets methylated. There's a whole set of half a million uh, predicted regulatory elements that um, become demethylated and then remethylated as adult, in adults. And there's a paper we have on the bioarchive that describes this in the mouse brain. But if you just measure the bulk amount, it doesn't dramatically change, okay, over time. But if you measure this non-symmetric methylation, it pretty much starts at zero at birth and accumulates um, in neurons mostly, um, although it does accumulate somewhat in glial cells, but mostly neurons, actually to a higher level in the human brain, actually, if, if these are different scales here, but about 8% of the, of the cytosines are methylated in a CA context in your neuron, and about 5% or cytosine methylated in a CG context. And all of this is happening to a very critical period of development, okay, where neurons are making connections. There's a lot of synaptogenesis going on here. And there's no cell division for the most part, except in you know, the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus. And, but most of the brain is not dividing here. So you're, you're accumulating methylation in this, during this critical window. And there's a lot of interesting experiments that, are, that we're, I don't have time to talk about here where, you, for example, there's a visual input can be blocked in the mouse and you can then look at development of visual cortex in the absence of stimulus during this critical period when things are getting wired up. So we, we carried out this purification that I mentioned with Jeremy, okay? And so if you grind up the whole cortex, and this is the methylation pattern that you see over two different genes in the genome right here, okay? And if you were to, if you were to ask, is this, <clears throat> is this change in gene expression here? That's what we're looking at, whole cortex. So here's the transcripts that are coming. And you say, oh, is there a change in, is there any signature that you can detect in the methylome? The answer is no, you can't see anything, okay? because the signal is actually coming from 1% of the cells in the PV or 2% of the cells in the VIP. When you look here, the poly, so you're doing it. So uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether methylation affects gene expression. The answer in neurons is it's 100% correlated. Okay, when you sequence the transcriptome and the methylome, 
uh, from the same cell, you can correlate transcription with methylation variation. Whether it's causative, I have no idea, but it's perfectly correlated, okay? But when you do these kinds of bulk experiments, you don't see really what the signature is. And here you can see the footprint in the CA methylation. Essentially, it's a footprint of the transcription unit. Okay? It's completely prevented from, presumably, from DNMT3A accessing that, that part of the genome. And so you can begin to associate these <coughs> differentially methylated regions, not only in the transcribed unit, but upstream. Okay? It turns out that if you look at DNA methylation variation in the mouse in, I think we've looked at 20 some organs at 10 developmental stages, this is the bioarchive, 90% of the methylation variation is 10 KB or more away from the promoter. So essentially nothing is happening at promoter, okay, in terms of methylation, except in cancer, where it's actually, <laughs> It has a big role, that is there's hypermethylation of many genes in the promoter. But just in terms of the relative amount of variation that you see, most of the variation is distal to the promoter. Okay. Um, so if you, if you zoom in to these sort of purified cell populations, you can find regions neuron type specific. So PV, you know, PV hypermethylation or hypomethylation, VIP, these were genes that would be hypomethylated or hypermethylated are very specific to those classes and then a whole bunch that don't vary much. And there's some interesting association of these changes with gene expression and particularly on long genes. Neurons have, neuronal specific genes are actually quite long and they're enriched. So if you look at the longest genes in the genome, they, they're enriched in genes expressed in neurons. And so there's an interesting relationship between gene expression and silencing of long genes that I'll point to just a few papers. I don't have time to, to go into the discussions. But labs that have studied, Mike Greenberg, Kuda Zogby, Adrian Bird, have studied extensively MECP2, which binds to CG methylation. So that is the known target, uh, MECP2 is methyl binding you know, protein. Uh, it actually binds to non-CG methylation as good, if not better, in a comp competition assay. So until we spotted this non-CG methylation, it was completely unknown. And if you actually compare the data from these labs, they were finding very different results when you look at the knockout mouse as to which genes are affected or not in a knockout. But if you focus on the, the genes that have non-CG methylation, you get a very good correlation of the data between labs. So that, that suggests that you know, MECP2 binding in addition to CG to non-CG methylation, which recruits a repressor complex, several different repressor complexes, to presumably silence those genes is, is playing a role in this, in this process. Um, so we uh, use this Arapidopsis uh, sort of assay and have applied it to human transcription factors, but also UC Tapali and more recently Gary Stormo did a very beautiful comparative assay on a relatively small number of transcription factors, but a very high quantitative assay where he measured the, in a competitive way, um, the ability of a transcription factor to bind to methylated or unmethylated motifs uh, and, and found that there's, a, there's, a, there's the, and U, UC's lab found that about 50% of all the human transcription factors that he um, tested, although the set was biased towards homeo domain proteins, were affected in their binding to their motif by methylation. And so we wanted to get sort of an even deeper view, so we went to develop, um, we in this case is Chung Wang Luo, one of the most fantastic postdocs that's ever joined my lab, um, technically and, and, <laughs> and in every other aspect. Um, and he developed this assay where we could um, we don't have to sort nuclei, but because it's still relatively expensive to profile uh, the methylome, we sequence about a million reads per cell. He uses NUN, um, that is a, a neuron-specific marker, and we sort of leave behind the cells that are non-NUN uh, non positive. That actually leaves some classes of neurons behind, so we're sort of, as we ramp up here, we're including more. We collect about 10% of these cells and 90% of these cells so we don't miss something. And then we just drop nuclei into wells, and now we're going to 1536 plates. Um, we could do easily you know, 6,000 a week, and we're hoping now to ramp that four times to 25,000 a week um, to be able to profile significant numbers of cells because the brain is, is 
has got an enormous number of neurons. We want to get a sampling of, of all the brain regions, at least in the mouse. Uh, and so the key with, with Chang Young is there are a couple of other assays that Wolf Reek has a nice assay to measure um, individual methylomes. The difference is, is that um, we only do sort of a one round of amplification. Um, we don't reprime. And so we have very high mappability rate because we worked with Swift Biosciences when they had developed a technology to capture the end of the molecule. So you can prime and extend. And then we need to capture the end of the molecule. And that's a very inefficient process, but they have a very efficient process to essentially tail the end of the molecule. So we, can then, we don't have to go through multiple rounds of adding P, uh, uh, PCR um, ad, uh, primers and then cycling, which gives you a lot of clonal, clonality issues as well as chimeric reads and things. So anyway, those are the technical details. What we do is we, we basically, we can either bin the genome or we can bin genes. So either 100 KB bins or actually genes. And we, we typically read out greater than 250 cytosine methylation events in a, two, in a 100 KB bin. Um, and that gives us about 22, if you use RNAs as, as genes here, like gen code annotation. So that's more than protein coding genes, non-coding RNAs, et cetera. 53,000 genes, we can measure 22,000 in a, about half or so in, in the assay by scoring methylation across the genes of the gene body. <clears throat> and so we take that data and then I don't have time to go through this, but we carry out iterative clustering analysis in a, in a routine that allows us to, to determine. So start with you know, the, the classes that I told you, excitatory, inhibitory, glia, et cetera. This just shows motor cortex, okay? It was part of the cortical cortex. Um, that then, then those are further subdivided based on iterative uh, uh, K, K nearest neighbor clustering, uh, and then feature selection and then reclustering uh, to give you another set of, of layer specific markers. For example, here's layer four or five, et cetera. And then those clusters can be further subdivided where we can say, okay, what are the differences between these four PV clusters? And we could tell you, you know, there's you know, 2000 differentially methyl regions or genes, et cetera that separate these and which, which they are. So we can define what those differences are um, so that down the road we can say, okay, these are potential regulatory elements that are unique to those subtypes. Because our goal here is to not only identify cell types, but to make genetic drivers to be able to target these cells using regulatory elements from these that are unique to these subtypes. Okay, so what does that look like? Just as sort of just a snapshot of, you know, here's 166 this is from human brain now, 166 layer two, three neurons that were identified. And this is a 450 KB window. And each one of these tracks here, so yellow is, is uh, depleted in methylation, blue is enriched in methylation. So just getting a snapshot of the, the window across this gene of the differential methylation in these different cell clusters. And this is kind of the standard track view where you've sort of averaged, you've collapsed all of this data and just make one statement about what the methylation pattern is. Whereas here we're looking at the individual cells that we've profiled to just give you an idea of what the sort of raw data looks like. So you don't need statistics to see the differences, right? You can see very big differences in the gene body methylation of this gene, also in the regulatory elements. So what we did to convince ourselves that there was <laughs> something interesting here is we actually did layer dissections. We said, we took a piece of the mouse cortex, we used undissected, we profiled you know, several hundred cells. We did a, a dissection of the superficial layers, sort of layer one, two, and then five, six, and then everything in the middle. Okay, and we profiled these three. So we knew tr what the truth was of where you came from. Okay? So this was the clusters that were generated by actually an earlier method that wasn't quite sophisticated. But nevertheless, from these clusters, we could overlay those data that we had from the collaboration with Jeremy Nathans, where we had purified PV VIP in excitatory neurons. And so they, they land, and actually then we did SST as a separate, it's another inhibitory neuron. And they land right on these clusters. But the excitatory neuron, this, you know, sort of if you use the new end market, it kind of lands right in the middle of this huge cluster. So that suggests there's an enormous diversity of cell types of the 
excitatory neuron group. So if you take this undissected piece, where we just took a piece of the whole cortex, and then you randomly, you know, you, you, we know each cell that we sequence, and we put it back in its context and ask, from undissected, where did you land? Well, you landed like a shotgun blast throughout the all layers because we didn't dissect anything, okay? If you now ask, well, where are the superficial cells and the middle, mid, mid layer cells in these clusters? So superficial cells actually map to the top of these clusters. You know, middle layer sort of maps here and deep layer sort of map here. In other words, the information contained in the methylomes of the cells is what drove the separation, but they physically are different. They know that their physical location is correlated with their methylation state. Okay? And this is using the gene body methylation. You can get the same thing if you just call the upstream regulatory element methylation depletion. You get the same. <clears throat> it's not quite as robust because the, the regions are smaller. The genes are big. The regulatory elements are you know, 100 bases or 200 bases. But overall, you get very similar clusters. So we thought, oh, that's good. So let's now, let's now go through the whole brain, okay? Slice up the brain like a bologna, okay? <laughs> Into 18 slices. And this is carried out by my, my fantastic collaborator, Marga Behrens, who's been involved in all these projects. She's a neurobiologist, excellent mouse and that brain anatomist. And so these are what, would look, what the slices would look like if you, if, you, if you annotated the regions using the Allen Brain Atlas. So Allen, Paul Allen, has devoted a lot of his resources to, to the human study of the human brain and mouse brain. And it, there's a wonderful atlas that if you go to the Allen Brain Atlas, you can see. They've done in situ hybridization essentially with every gene in the mouse genome. And so these maps would actually be overlaid with in situ hybridization. So this is just a map of one slice, slice four. Okay, so we'd ice, Marga would dissect these regions, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They're all, they all have interesting uh, names for different cortical regions for the most part here, or subcortical regions, purify those. We'd carry out single cell methylation. And what I won't talk about is very interesting work from Bing Ren, a long-term collaborator on looking at open chromatin in these re regions. So here's just an example of what the data looks like. So here's some cortical areas of the brain, uh, motor cortex, the uh, somatosensory cortex, uh, and other regions of the cortex. And these are some of the clusters you got. So this is a, a snapshot. I think we've done 70,000 plus cells, methylomes. And these are, here's 31,000. And these are the different clusters that are annotated by the well-known uh, markers for these inhibitory neurons or layer-specific neurons, et cetera, here. And there's some clusters that are unannotated because they're some of these sub subtypes. So they might be uh, layer, there might be other VIP subtypes. This is TISNY, so these are kind of spread a lot. This, this is a, a way of dimensionality reduction that doesn't necessarily maintain the relationships between these clusters, but other methods do. And so we can kind of get a snapshot of what's going on. But if we zoom in, let's just take, just look at genes and say, okay, if I take, and we have a map, we have a website now, you can take any gene you're interested in and say, okay, where does that gene show hypomethylation? And so here's just a number of genes and, and their hypomethylation pattern. And if you look at the equivalent RNA-seq data, it's a perfect match. Wherever the 8RB gene is, these clusters that show hypomethylation will show enriched RNA. And so we can predict based on this gene body depletion and methylation where the genes are expressed from looking at that. Now, if you kind of zoom into one particular cluster, let's say here, from just one slice, slice four, where we're looking at layer 5B, in that cortex, all the neurons that map to layer 5B, you can kind of see something that's going on. You see the colors are sort of not overlapping. You see blue, you see orange, you see green. Because these, um, these, these slices here, um, as I showed you, they're, they're a little bit thick. And, and so if you, if you have neurons that are displaced by you know, 100 microns, they're different from one another. So they're all layer 5B excitatory neurons but they're in slightly different parts of the cortex, okay? And so the information, so within that cortex, you can blow that up and, and ask, okay, all those layer 5B neurons, if you try to separate them by our method, they actually separate. So blue ones would be the motor cortex, primary motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, et cetera. All these, the colors here match these clusters. So depending on where they are in the brain, they're all layer 5B. They all lay in layer 5B. But if you're here, here, or here, that is sort of going down the side of the brain, uh, 
they actually cluster differently. So we can tell these differences and what genes there are there. What genes are differentially methylated in the ACA versus the motor cortex or somatosensory cortex can be determined by looking at the mass load. So that they know top to bottom, I already showed you layer one, two, three, four, five, and they sort of know the side and actually know front to back. So if you look at visual cortex versus frontal cortex, you can tell the differences. So there's a lot of information in the differentially methylated regions and in the open chromatin regions, and these can be combined. Differentially methylated regions, open chromatin regions can be combined to call enrichments of transcription factors. Paul was showing me some beautiful data of his lab on doing exactly the same thing with ATAC-seq data. And so we combine the methylation data with the ATAC-seq data to, and run an algorithm we call uh, Reptile, which was published a few years ago, to say, okay, um, these colors represent these regions over here, the ACA motor cortex, for example. And you can see that there are, they're all cortical neurons in layer 5B, but they have different enrichments. So there's a, a, a particular transcription factor here, brain 2, which is also called PAL3, which is highly enriched in this uh, uh, motor cortex region, but not, not enriched in, in adjacent, okay, um, adjacent five, layer 5B five types, okay? So you can see the enrichment. Let me go back to here, okay? But there's no enrichment really over in, this, in these, some of these clusters, although they're all layer 5B cortical neurons. So there, there are different enrichments of transcription factors that, and these are well known to sort of neural development people, but there are lots of motifs. I'm just showing you some of these enrichments. Now, the other interesting thing is that if you look at the inhibitory neurons, I mentioned there were these two major classes. You can see here, you can identify one class PV, the other class SST, but all the colors are overlapping one another, you see? So the, the, no matter where you are, okay, if you're an inhibitory neuron and you're an SST type, in, they all just sort of, they, they, they all land on top of one another based on their brain region, okay? And so what this means is that, that it's interesting that you have cortical neurons where actually I, I didn't describe to you, they're born in the cortical region. These inhibitory neurons migrate in from, into the brain from so-called ganglionic eminences. And so they're actually born somewhere else. And they actually have markers of where they're born. But you can't tell where they, you know, where they sit in the brain, it looks the same. Okay? Whether you're in the front, back, top, bottom, they all look the same. You can tell them apart from one another that there are different subtypes, but those subtypes can't be distinguished from one another based on where they live in the brain. And this is actually being borne out also by the folks that are looking at the RNA, the transcriptional profiles. And the same thing that you can do with excitatory neurons, you can do with inhibitory neurons, you can call enrichments, okay? So you have these two subtypes of parvalbumin inhibitory neurons. One group is enriched in this class of transcription factors. The other group is enriched in the FOS immediate early transcription factors, so so-called potentially activated and these are not activated in this immediate early transcript. So this is based on you know, several hundred thousand differentially methylated regions in these subtypes, right? So there's a lot of differences that you can identify. Then, you, of course, the, the, the goal of this is really, you know, it's interesting to study the mouse, but to apply this to, to, to the human brain. So we've begun to do that. Um, this is just a few thousand, 6,000 methylomes comparing different brain regions. Uh, it's certainly more complicated. Um, Bing Ren is also in parallel carried out a taxi of these split the nuclei, give them the Bing, he's carried out a taxi. And we're trying now to merge this data. It's not so easy actually to merge these different data types, even if they're the same from the same pool of nucleus, because there's, there's, there are signatures, as I, as I just mentioned, of what's, going, what's happened in the past with the development of these neurons in the methylome that doesn't seem to be present in what's happening right now in the open chromatin. And so it's a little bit tricky. You get slightly different clusters. Um, <clears throat> you can use this information to call regulatory elements in the human brain. That's here. So Rick Young identified these elements he calls super enhancers, clusters of enhancers. They're very interesting. And many of the genes that, that Rick I had identified, we can recapitulate by looking at these very large footprints of methylation that occur in the, in the human brain. And they can be very, very specific. They can be inhibitory neurons of so these would be sub, subtypes. So these are all inhibitory neurons. The, the PV don't have this footprint. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the VIP don't. The PV and the SST do. You see this big hole here. So the inhibitory neuron subclasses can be defined. These would fit into 
Rick's categorization when we look at chromatin marks of super enhancers, plus super enhancers. We can easily see that in the, in the methylation data. And largely, these are probably involved in some phase transition, and they're excluding a lot of things, and probably including the methyl transferases. And so what you can do then is begin to take those layer-specific differentially methylated regions, look at the enrichments of GWAS-SNPs, okay, in all these genome-wide association studies, and ask, are there enrichments for the regulatory elements that are unique to different subtypes, so, or different layers? So layer 5 here, for example, dash 1, no enrichment of regulatory elements in GWAS-SNPs. Right next to it, layer 4, yes. Layer 4 regulatory elements based on the uh, attack seek and methylation data has a significant enrichment. So you might want to look there and for sort of biochemical, uh, further biochemical or targeting studies for it. These are just the very beginnings. We haven't done a huge amount of sequencing. This is only maybe based on 10,000 cells. So the final thing I want to talk about is ultimately we want to not only link the cells, but to the cells to their circuits. And so this is a, an effort that we've, again, using epigenetic profiling to begin to link the cells to who they connect to. And this is a collaboration with Ed Calloway's lab. And so Ed and his colleagues are doing, uh, we're using a mouse that, that I mentioned, this mouse that Jeremy Nathan's lab collected, uh, 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 developed called the intact mouse, where you have a Cre that's flank, uh, lock sites that flank a stop here that's removed in a Cre dependent fashion. And so what you can do is inject the virus into, for example, the striatum that carries Cre, and then it will retrograde um, move for, to axon, down the axons that connects to the motor cortex, for example. And that will activate a GFP that then labels the nuclei in the motor cortex. So injects the virus in the striatum, it's picked up in the axon terminals, maps back to the cell body, and then activates the GFP so that it, it it now if, if, uh, inserts into the nuclear membrane. Then we can fax and isolate those, those nuclei that have been activated. And so you'll get the motor cortex to striatal projection neurons. Only those motor cortex neurons that are projected from the, to the striatum will be labeled. And you can do that many, many times. And so we actually have a project that's, um, that involves mapping by injecting into all of these projections and, be, and more than this into these different brain regions to then ask um, in those neurons, okay, so these would be the clusters that are developed of all those cortical neurons from, let's say in this case, six, six injection experiments where you've injected eight different brain regions. And so here you inject, this is all motor cortex here, uh, and these were injected in the striatum, okay, and then motor cortex cells labeled. Uh, and for example, up here, here's the superior colliculus. These are the cells that are labeled in the motor cortex. They're highly enriched in layer 5B. So if you go back to the map here of all these cells, the cells that are labeled here are in the layer 5B. From the thalamus, they're in 5B. And depending on where you did the inject, you can see 5B is not labeled. So defining what cells can project to different regions is reflected by their methylome or potentially their transcriptome. We really haven't looked. Uh, at that, and the cells are too few here. Maybe you'll only get 100 or 200 cells labeled. It's been too few to really uh, do a tax seek in the methods that we're currently using for a tax seek. But you can get projection specific, and so the, the, the and this just shows some of these 5B enriched uh, um, injections here. But what that gets you are the genes that are different between those. So all of these are motor cortex neurons. The ones that were labeled here that are, you're looking at the methylome were from superior colliculus or the somatosensory cortex or the striatum. And you can see here the ones that for this particular gene are depleted in methylation only in the motor neurons that are projecting to the, from layer 5B to the superior colliculus. So you can define projection-specific genes that are expressed and projection-specific regulatory elements in these cases. And these just show some other examples of those. And there, if you, if you classify these genes, they're highly enriched in things that, that suggest that they are involved in that, in the uh, differentiation of the, of the neural system. So then if you have elements that can target these cells, specifically drivers of Cre that you wanted to ablate those cells or you wanted to activate something in those cells. That's kind of the goal. So we're trying to link what I showed you were upstream potential enhancers, 
But linking those to the genes is also a challenge, right? I showed you gene body depletion, methylation upstream, there's gonna be some depletion of DNA methylation, but it could be many different elements that are depleted. And so what we're doing is trying to link those elements to promoters. And what we're doing is we've collaborated with Jesse Dixon's lab to adapt the assay of proximity ligation where you can take uh, and cross-link uh, nuclei so that two regions that, for example, that were in a loop right here, that if you cross-link the, 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 uh, the protein here to the DNA, and then you cut the DNA, and then you ligate it together, the so-called proximity ligation assay developed by Yuff Decker and others, um, you can then, this is the cut DNA, and then you ligate it together, you can bring together sequences that are separated by a distance, presumably, uh, if this blue one is a promoter and this is a putative enhancer, you now have some evidence of looping. And so we, what we've done with Jesse is not only do the in, in single cell, but also capture the methylation profile from these. So what we do is we take this uh, high C, essentially 3C kind of assay, uh, and then put it into our methylone pipeline. So we've captured the DNA, and along this DNA are gonna be methylation differences, both in the enhancer and presumably around the promoter, and we'll be able to capture that so we're doing single cell, multi-omic assay, high C and methylation. And so that's just shown here. I just sort of throw up one of these diagrams. These are the single nuclei, only let's say 200 nuclei. And we can take that and re reconstruct if we synthetically pull, pull those 200 cells together and look at this is sort of looks like this typical interaction map of regions where ver things along the, dial dial the diagonal here are very close to one another and things that Essentially, you're mapping chromosome three against chromosome three. Anything off the diagonal is mapping in a loop at a distance. And so we can, we can recapitulate that from this assay. We can also recapitulate the methylation profiles. These happen to be embryonic stem cells. And so, yeah, this is really interesting because when we, when we cluster based on the CH methylation or CG methylation, we can separate these, these cell types reasonably well. And so that says the methylation assay is working. The 3C assay actually does, so these are structural variants now, the loops are separating these differences between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, it, it doesn't separate them super well, um, but it actually separates the other cell types pretty well. And so now we're, this is only with a few hundred cells. So we're now digging in deeper because we can sort of see hints in looking at these excitatory, when you dig down into studying this sort of triangleology here of interactions, you can find enrichments, for example, in these between, if you compare the high C maps of inhibitory and uh, at excitatory neurons, you can find regions that are actually enriched. This interaction one is actually enriched over here and interaction two is enriched in excitatory cells. So we're getting some hints, even from a few hundred cells that we can identify loops or, or differences between excitatory and inhibitory neurons um, using this multi-omic assay. So just to wrap up here, DNA methylation profiles, as well as open chromatin profiles, allow us to classify these brain cell types. Yet the cells actually have a, a huge amount of information in their, in their epigenome, if you will, about where they live in the brain. And so they, you, which, which layer they're in, whether they're more caudal or, uh, or, or, or whether they're, they're sort of on the sides of the cortex, uh, can be, so if, if you gave me a cell from the mouse brain, at least from the regions we profile, I could tell you where it lives in the brain. Not exactly within that, you know, exactly it's spatially, um, but, but, but pretty, pretty close to that atlas that the Allen brain um, group um, developed. You can predict transcription factor enrichments, uh, and ultimately we want to understand how the different um, uh, TFs are affected in terms of their sensitivity. So when we see a differentially methylated region, in a putative regulatory element, we have some idea what the code is of which factors may or may not be affected in terms of the methylation variation there. Um, uh, we can identify SNP enrichment, so provide some information uh, that I think enables, helps the GWAS folks to get a better idea of what cell types may be affected. Uh, we can use this information to look at projections and the regulatory elements that are associated with neuronal projections. And I think these sort of multi-omic assay is gonna make it a little bit easier to begin to start to associate these different data types when they're from the same nucleus. And what we've, we're beginning to learn is, is that actually the information is not the same. When you cluster 
from the same nucleus, you have 200 cells, cluster based on methylation, cluster based on open chromatin or high C, you actually get slightly different clusters. So the information of what's happening right now or what happened in the past actually drives those cells to say, hey, we've got something similar to one another but different than what's happening in the open chromatin right now. And so <clears throat> this work, I mentioned the plant folks, the plant biology folks who are not listed on here, Ryan Lister, Bob Schmitz, were the main folks in driving that Teiji Kawakatsu in my lab. And the folks that were, have been driving the brain initiative are really mainly two or four people, two postdoctoral uh, students, Chang Wang Luo, who's uh, out on the job market. He's fantastic, he has many offers already. Um, Zhu Zhu Zhang, maybe next year, she's working on mainly on the visual cortex. Two amazing uh, graduate uh, students from bioinformatics pro program, Jin Ting and Han Ching, uh, and uh, a lot of technical staff, as you can imagine, for these kinds of projects. The last thing I mentioned about the high C is a collaborator with Jesse Dixon, who's a Salk fellow, so, so came out of Bing Ren's lab to, with his PhD. And we, 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 he started his own lab with no postdoc and is doing really fantastic work. Um, Ed Callaway, who's leading, is the core, sort of card-carrying neuroscientist of this group. Ed has a, a developed viral, viral delivery technology, for example, rabies virus, and his group doing a lot of the injections. And that includes other Salk faculty, Shin and Kuo Fan, who've been doing injections. I mentioned Marga, who's doing all the dissections and nuclear purification. Bing is our long-term collaborator. He's involved pretty much in everything that we do. In, uh, he's a part of this brain initiative that we're funded to do. We have a U19 center. And Iran is a, uh, a, a assistant professor at UCSD. He used to be at Salk. He was in Terry Sinalski's lab. He's a computational neuroscientist who's really putting his major effort into this sort of data integration approach. Uh, and our funders are here. So I'll stop there and take any questions you have. John. So how, how does open chromatin and methylone compare with transcriptome? Yeah. Different types. Yeah. And, and, and to look at the, you know, the activity that's, that's happening at that time. Yeah. I can imagine methylone and open chromatin sometimes lag behind. Or, or yeah. There, yeah. So John's question is how do the different uh, the modalities, so transcriptome, uh, that's happening right then in those cells versus some of the other modalities like methylation, which may have a different timeline um, in terms of its dynamics or open chromatin. Very good question. What you can see with one versus the other is kind of a, a challenge. So if you do sort of droplet-based sequencing, you kind of just skim the surface of what, you know, maybe the top 2,000 to 4,000 genes. Um, uh, the open chromatin you, we're getting, I think we're, Bing is getting maybe, let's say, 1,000 to 10,000 reads per cell or something. So it's sampling a subset of the 200,000 or whatever more open chromatin sites. The methylation is very deep, but we can't do as many cells. So trying to overlap all this is, <laughs> is our challenge. We're, we're taking, so we now have developed an assay to measure RNA and methylation in the same nucleus. It's on paper in the bio archive. So we're, we're going to have a better answer for you about the dynamics. Um, but if you just compare, so, so there's a scale difference. So what you can actually see and then, then what you can overlap turns out to be a relatively small piece and probably the most abundant genes, right? Most of their transcripts. So smart seek would be if you did smart seek much deeper in those same cells. I think we'd have a. I think I'd have an answer for you as to. But there's a lot of. Let's say if you look at the. If you look at the number of differentially methyl regions, overlap that. So it's a big circle because there's a lot of things that are ha have kind of happened in the past. There's a nice paper on bioarch, you know, a molecular cell last week from a group at that Dana Farber looking at. Um, something that Bing Ren discovered a while ago called vestigial enhancer. So you can see lots of events because they look at intestinal villi and they can see the lineage. And so they look and say, oh, where do these differentially methylated regions, what are they? They're open, they're open, but where, where were they? If you look back in development, they were an enhancer in an earlier time. So Bing called them vestigial enhancers. And because they have a time course, they can follow those things. So there's a lot of information in the methylome that's, that's not from now. 
Some of it overlaps with open chromatin, and some of that will overlap with transcriptome. But I think if I gave you an answer, it would be just the top 2,000 genes and may not be representative of the most interesting ones. But it's a very good thing to do. If you can do deep transcriptome sequencing on the same nuclei, I think you'd be able to get an answer about the how, you, certainly when you cluster them, you can get different clusters, right? So there is information in those. But you know, certainly for the methylome, that data can tell us where, for example, the the, the inhibitory neurons came from, and that's information that's no longer represented in the transcriptome. That happened, you know, during the development and ontogeny of those cells. <laughs> yeah, so most of the, the most, so you can see it in other tissues. So if you look on this paper, he et al, that we have on bioarchive for the last two years, it's on the, it's accepted in principle in nature. It shows, um, it shows accumulation in, in post-mitotic muscle, you know, in, in muscle. So many, in many different, uh, you know, heart and esop, um, stomach, et cetera, you'll see a little bit of accumulation. And it accumulates at a point where the, and in, enriched on the bodies of transcription factors that when you ask what they are, they're the master regulators of the genesis of that organ. So if you look at all the data from, you know, the heart development, you'll find the major transcription factors involved in heart development as the heart matures, they begin to accumulate CH methylation over the body of the transcription factors that presumably, and it's correlated with silencing of those. But it's, it's a fraction of the amount. So it might be 10% of the amount of methylation that you would see in a neuron, even lower, maybe 5%. So, but that could be, we're, it's bulk, we're grinding. So it could be a few cells in that. It could be, it could be that it's just a very you know, sparse amount of methylation. We don't know because we haven't done single cell profiling of those organs, but it does accumulate in a variety of tissues. In, 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 but at a much lower level, and it identifies with amazing accuracy every TF that you go back in the literature and say, oh, that was this study in development. They showed this TF was involved in making a kidney, right? It just, it maps out the master regulators of those tissues. So you want to shut them off, presumably. You've finished the development, you want to shut them down. And it, it may not be directly at fault. It may just be some signature. We don't know the causality of this, but it's certainly a good marker for what, 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 what was happening at, in that organ. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.